Good evening, thank you for being at this lecture of the plantation melodies of Stephen Collins Foster. The purpose of this project is to offer 21st century music lovers an opportunity to gain insight into the era of American minstrelsy and learn of the constructive efforts of Stephen Collins Foster, who composed plantation melodies for the minstrel stage. He is known as the father of American music. Foster was born 1826 in the outskirts of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, amidst a celebration on July the 4th. Even as a very small child, Stephen displayed musical talent. It is said that the music came from his mother's side of the family. When he was two years old, he would carefully pick out harmonics on the guitar. He called it his Itty Pisani, little piano. At age nine years old, he and a group of neighborhood boys formed a thespian company, which performed three times a week in an old carriage house. Stephen was their star performer and was paid more than the other boys. He was a favored soloist among the audience. He would sing the latest Ethiopian caricature songs to a packed house. This was an era that enjoyed entertainment at the expense of enslaved Africans. So as we gaze into history, you are challenged to put aside your cultural sensitivities. If you do not, and if you have already prejudged this information as unworthy of investigation, you may miss the chance to glean subtleties found in Foster's music. Please lay down your politically correct binoculars and instead peer through the lenses of one who lived in the mid 19th century. Delving into difficult discussions can be uncomfortable. This is obvious with the amount of pushback and resistance in response to discussions on critical race theory. We are at a point in time where many Americans would rather glaze over entire eras of history than study and learn from them. Though romanticized versions of history have been accepted in history books for decades, these sunny perspectives convey imbalanced, insincere, unrealistic, and therefore half-true renderings of the past. You are challenged to listen with an open mind and not to judge too quickly what you hear and see. Consider attending a minstrel show. You will hear and see the performers in blackface, singing, dancing, the excitement of it all. Each song in this lecture was composed by Stephen Foster, including the Tioga Waltz played by the soon-to-be Dr. Casey Payer Xavier. He was quite a prolific composer and wrote many kinds of song. So why was he considered the father of American music? He was actually the first composer who was able to make a living writing songs. We will learn more about his life later in the lecture. I wanted to show a few um, slides that were popular during the era. The focus of this project is not merely to revisit race, racist themes found in minstrelsy, but more so to explore how Stephen Foster worked within the confines of the era to produce an unconventional song style, which would be heard by thousands from the minstrel stage. The newer songs were known as plantation melodies now the title, Plantation Melody,
carries some confusion since these melodies were not created by enslaved Africans on plantations, but by white male composers and entertainers telling a tale about Africans on plantations. In fact, because these shows were publicized on posters with entertainers wearing the conventional blackface paint, many audiences believed they were Africans and that they were getting a peek into the African culture. Now, I didn't tell you this would um, all make sense, only that we would take an objective look into the era. So if the performance weren't African and the melodies were not written by Africans, what exactly of minstrelsy can be traced to African culture? It's certainly not the songs. Ironically, it's the instruments that were used in the minstrel shows. The instruments included an early form of the banjo, tambourine, and bones. The fiddle and banjo made vital contributions to the minstrel show, which invariably included a tambourine derived from African percussion instruments and a pair of bones Today, um, there are a linked pair of castanets, and these all provided the timbre and rhythmic effects desired for various rural musics. On the next slide is another Ethiopian song that we will talk a little bit about later. Here we go. Thank you, Mr. Jim Ellidge. <laughs> Banjo player extraordinaire and lover of Stephen Foster tunes. Next slide. All right, so you've heard the term Ethiopian song. So I wanted to be sure that we listed a few of these components. An Ethiopian song, the form is strophic with a verse and refrain, sharing some of the same material. Refrains usually are sung in unison. They are simple and short phrases using small intervals and stepwise movement. Limited melodic range of an octave or less, and phrases are linked together sometimes in a non-symmetrical AB form. Also in these Ethiopian songs, there is an inclusion of nonsense syllables like da 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 dolly or do da do da that you heard in Cape Town races. Um, it utilizes a dialect of uh, broken English. Uh, the tempo is usually brisk and often performed to a jig or other approximated dances. It has a catchy melody with heterophony in the accompaniment, which is just the embellishment of the melody. The mood is always very, very happy, and it refers to the enslaved African as nigger. That was in the first publication of Foster's music. 
Immediately after that, when Foster started writing the plantation melodies, he changed all the references to Africans as darkies. In the next minstrel poster, this is just um, another caricature uh, in blackface. And then in the next poster, I wanted just that we would take a moment to speak about caricatures. Um, you'll see two, these are actually opposites. And there are several names and you'll see those in a moment. But the first one here, this was the character created by Thomas Dartmouth and that is in your notes. That is Jim Crow. He is an enslaved African. He speaks very, um, very, very bad English. Sometimes it's called slave dialect, um, but it's just a broken English. He's a little disfigured. Um, he has very, very um, ratty clothing on, and um, he just likes to have fun. Um, and so that is an example, a picture of what some would call a coon. On the other side, we have the zip coon. This is an emancipated African. He is, um, he has on his finery, a top hat, um, usually he has gloves, he has the watch, and he has a long coat. But if you'll see his figure, there's just something about it, it's still irregular. And what's most noteworthy about him is this person uses very big words, four and five syllable words, but he misuses them. The next screen. I've listed a few of the caricature, caricatures um, uh, that these are the common names. So the first one we uh, showed you, Jim Crow or Sambo or Coon, an enslaved African male, not so bright, shirks work on the plantation, frightens easily, and speaks in an exaggerated dialect. The Zip Coon or Jim Dandy or Jan Dandy Jim, a northern freedman dressed in finery that we just uh, discussed. The old darky or um, white-haired uncle. And this is one of the most moving symbols of the plantation family. Um, minstrelsy blended together, intense sentimentality with the old people about to die, along with lifelong friendship and deep family ties. Underneath that, we have the Uncle Tom, uh, which denotes an African male who accepts a servile position um, under whites. And then we have the mammy or the old auntie, the l a large, nurturing, laughing cook on the plantation. And at the bottom, we have the pickaninnies, which were depicted as mischievous, wide-eyed, unruly-haired children on the plantation. But the two caricatures that we will focus on in this presentation are the Jim Grow or the coon character and the zip coon. All right, now we are ready to hear from an actual minstrel show. Mr. Bones, are you ready? Mr. Tambo, are you ready? Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Foster's Gwine to Run All Night, published in 1849. The narrator, an enslaved African, has leave from the plantation to attend the races. He speaks in a dialect and appears quite satisfied. He happily takes his winnings home in a tow bag.
The next component that we will discuss are the ballads. Another completely different song form in which Foster excelled was the ballad. A ballad is a folk song which tells a story in a simple, direct fashion, offering little to no background or detail, and thus allowing free reign to the listener's imagination. Many American ballads relate famous historical events, while others, such as Barbara Allen, tell of ill-fated love affairs. Components of a traditional ballad include that they're traditionally sung with little or no instrumental accompaniment. They are strophic and folk-like in nature. Verses may be added or altered. The tune may alter as it's passed down from one generation to the next or from one region to another. The melodic range is limited, usually an octave or less. The melody um, and conveying mood are the most important aspects of the ballad. The subject matter regales virtues of love, beauty, death, hero heroism, epic battles, and more. Now we do have components of the 19th century ballad, which is what Stephen Foster wrote. There are similarities. Uh, the 19th century ballad was composed with instrumental accompaniment in mind, the piano, the guitar, the banjo. It's also strophic, yet verses may not be altered because it's in sheet music form. Tempos are moderate. Melodic range is an octave or more containing wide leaps, even octaves. Melody and mood are the most important aspects. Melodies during the ballads are very, they're much more expansive. The subject matter is of loss, death, yearning for the past, and dissatisfaction with the present. Now I will sing Stephen Foster's Beautiful Dreamer.
So now you have heard examples of an Ethiopian song. You have seen some of the components and what that included. And you have seen the components of a ballad and heard one. Now we will talk about the plantation melodies. In Charles Ham's Yesterdays, he states, Foster had command of several national styles early in his career and integrated aspects of each into a very distinctive personal way of writing. As with national styles, he integrated aspects of the Ethiopian and ballad song style together and fashioned something altogether unique, a plantation song. Stephen Foster, expert Charles Ham, writes these songs differ from those of his contemporaries. Their texts begin to make a quite different view of the black American. In Foster's Plantation Minstrels, we are introduced to a noble African who in 1850 is enslaved, but gradually in these songs, he is an emancipated African. He's no longer on the plantation, yet strangely yearns for the familiarity of the plantation. In the plantation songs, it is so different from the Ethiopian songs that I thought it prudent that we discuss a little bit about the mask. You saw one of the performers in a black face mask. So I wanted to just explain that from the breaking down of the conventions that um, Foster did, and we'll talk more about that during the lecture. There actually, from a solid black mask, there is a, a, a literal breaking of the, the conventional thinking. And so for the a remainder of the lecture, I'll be wearing a different kind of mask. Old Uncle Ned, published in 1848. The narrator is a noble enslaved African. He speaks in a dialect and mourns venerated Uncle Ned, who is also noble with noble pursuits. Let's take a few moments to discuss some of the components of this piece. So um, as I said before, the plantation songs, it, they took components from both the ballad and the Ethiopian song. And so here we find with the circles, that's where you see uh, large leaps, even a full octave in this piece. There's text painting from lay down as the melodic line descends at the bottom at the red dot. Um, you'll hear that, you'll hear that line and this text painting, the words are, then lay down the shovel and the hoe. And then the melodic line goes down. There's more text painting for hang up the, um, hang up the fiddle and the bow where the melodic line rises. Note. The narrator is advocating laying down the work tools, perhaps even get rid of, and hanging up to place high the musical instruments. Is there a deeper meaning to what should be laid down or elevated? On the next slide, there is more musical um, support for the text. All voices in the chorus sing the same thing in unison. What makes this, um, what might this indicate if all say the same thing about the African laying down those work tools at that time? Ascending melodic line with plodding repeated notes suggests tension on no more 
hard work for poor old Ned. And then at the end of this phrase, gone where the good darkies go, pertaining to heaven, the rhythmic activity slows down from eighth notes to half notes. You'll see that at the top line. An additional observation, the B section acts as a double chorus. So you will, during the verse that I sing, immediately after that, you will hear the ensemble sing the same thing as the chorus. More components of the plantation melody. It recharacterizes the minstrel's African. I and we reflect each other in the text. Gradually, completely different melodic and textural character between verse and chorus. Tempos are slower, andante, and adagio. The next example is just the chorus of Masses in the Cold Ground. You may think this is a strange title for an enslaved person to sing. But remember, these words were written by white male composers, and the characters sang what the composer wanted them to say. The words they sang were appropriated. 
At first, I was greatly offended by the song title, but after researching Stephen Foster, I, find, I found the intention of his plantation melodies was first to have the African display an array of humane emotions. In Masses in the Cold Ground, all the enslaved Africans express deep felt grief and respect for the deceased plantation owner. Now we'll learn a little more about Mr. Stephen Foster. When he was 19, he and a group of five young men, including his brother Morrison, met at their home twice a week to practice harmonizing. They would sing all the Ethiopian songs, which were very popular at the time. One day after exhausting all the melodies they knew, Stephen proposed arranging new pieces for them. His efforts produced the Louisiana Bell and a week later, Old Uncle Ned. 
both of which became well-known compositions on the minstrel stage. As Foster continued composing, he wrote various types of songs, temperance songs, patriotic songs, lullabies, tributes to his mother, instrumental pieces, and hymns. But by the age of 23, he was most known for his ballads and his Ethiopian-style minstrel songs. It was in 1848, after he wrote Old Uncle Ned to much success, he decided to continue creating his plantation melodies. Oh, they were indeed written about the plantation, but what made these songs stand out as exemplary was for the first time in American history, Foster began to tell a different story about the enslaved African. This new narrative ceased the mocking and caricatures. Before we sing another melody for you, please look at the next slide. This is the covers, um, cover for the sheet music for Nellie Was a Lady. And let's look at the next one. Here, and the narrator, an African male in this piece, shows respect for his recently deceased wife by insisting they toll the bell. He proudly refers to his Nellie as a lovely lady and his dark Virginie bride. Though the text is preserved and the piece contains all the elements of a plantation melody, the publisher decided to depict a white male quartet rather than a dignified African. What might this imply? Nellie was a lady is a dirge. The narrator is not identified as enslaved, but we can assume he is due to the reference to tote the cottonwood no more. We do know that he works on the Mississippi River. The African male shows respect for his recently deceased wife by insisting they toll the bell. He proudly refers to his Nellie as a lovely lady and his dark Virginie bride. Before we present this piece in its entirety, I wanted to speak about some of the musical components which buttress the text and reveals foster tensions uh, even more. Uh, in the beginning, Right, you see where the two colors are. We have a two note uh, in a cadence, floating and toting. Um, those, uh, I'll just read here, there are strategically placed cadences where text as well as melody indicate a weighted motion in the release downward. These are specifically on the words through all of the verses on floating, Toting, weeping, and dawning. Let's go to the next slide. In this slide, I will need the assistance of our collaborative pianist. Would you please, uh, and you see I've written the stately chords in the piano, identify a dignified Nelly, um, and there are rests which, uh, when they're adhered to, um, gives a consideration and it gives the phrase clarity, but also is another way to show respect to Nally. And then after that, we will hear a chromatic passage sung by the choir. So if you would please just play these stately chords for us. Very good. Um, let's go to the next slide. We'll just do the chorus.
Um, this is actually a song sheet for Nellie Was a Lady. Because I couldn't find a, uh, I, well, this is actually what they used to pass out at the minstrel shows too, because they figured they would be able to get some money if the people liked the tune. So they would uh, pass out these sheets of paper with little frilly things just to get people excited. All right, um, on the next piece, uh, you may recognize this piece. Um, my old Kentucky home. The narrator experiences the past as if it is the present. He remembers the darkies vividly in the fields. Tis summer, they are happy and gay. But when hard times come knocking at the door, then he shall say, good night. Don't weep, my lady, we'll sing for the Kentucky home far away. In each of these melodies, Foster uplifts the African. His second intention for these songs is to portray the African as more human, more noble, more responsible, more respected. We see him loving his wife and speaking of her with tenderness and great respect. Over a period of 14 years, Foster elevates the image of the African until he enjoys all the rights of an American citizen. Since Foster wrote the melody, harmony, and text, this allowed him to say through music exactly what he wanted to say, fully and without hindrance. <laughs>
I made this chart as I studied Foster, as I continued to see more and more differences in these, uh, these different styles. So if you'll see at the top in the Ethiopian song, we just start from the simplest, the purpose. Ethiopian songs fashioned for the minstrel stage, the plantation, it was eventually fashioned for the parlor, even though the first ones were performed on the minstrel stage. The intent to entertain for the Ethiopian song and ridiculous and with uh, diff ridiculous African caricatures and bring the audience to laughter. Um, the intent of the plantation song is to reveal Africans as having humane emotions and having dignity. It encourages quiet self-reflection. The narrator in the Ethiopian song is an enslaved African and he's a happy worker. The narrator in the plantation songs, as they progress, is an emancipated African or any American. The narrative in the Ethiopian song is that plantation life is joyful and filled with enjoyable activities. The narrative of the plantation song is that the African achieves equal status, yet yearns for his master, the family, and the plantation. The subject matter of the Ethiopian song, acceptance of status, while in the plantation song, it deals with death and loss. That's the component coming from the ballad. Um, sentimentality and being alienated, alienated from what one loves. And the mood, we've seen that already this evening from happy and content, even in disfigurement for the Ethiopian songs to the plantation songs, the mood is sentimental nostalgia. Um, and this is where it gets a little more detailed, where the, the changes in the lengths of the mel melodies and the larger, uh, the larger intervals or spaces between notes is in the plantation melody. Wh uh, yes, while in the Ethiopians, you have the smaller intervals. So the song, it's getting wider and wider. The rests in the Ethiopian songs are at the ends of phrases. You just heard um, in the song that I just sang where there were um, rests in the middle of the phrases for effect. The diction from nonsense syllables and the uh, approximation of a slave diction, that uh, dialect, that as these songs progress, it um, slowly moves closer to standard English, standardized English. The dynamics, very little indication here, wherein you'll hear, especially uh, in the last one, um, down among the cane breaks, it's very detailed and uh, with the lots of emphasis on the text. The tempo, again, upbeat, which reflects a happy mood. And then for the plantation uh, melodies, diverse indications for slower pace, time for contem con contemplative reflection. It allows the performer freedom to reflect, to decide, to appreciate, and to consider. The next plantation melody is Old Folks at Home. The narrator is inferred to be emancipated, for he is no longer working on the plantation, but singing about how alienated he feels so far away from the plantation. He speaks with less dialect as he longs for the old folks. He expresses so much emotion that his heart is ever turning and all nature is saddened with his longing.
On the surface, these melodies may appear to expand a false narrative of slavery not being so bad, or that the enslaved African enjoyed his status and life on the plantation. But according to music major Justin Bell, an African-American undergraduate at the University of Southern Mississippi, he found this topic quite fascinating and stated, and I quote, this has many layers and many perspectives from which one might look. It is neither one nor the other in many things, but both. Thank you, Justin, for having an open mind by noting the radical character of, that was with the period, by noting the radical character changes Foster injects into his minstrel song, we see this was his way of working within the system to influence those who believed what the, what the minstrel stage taught them about the African. In the last example, down among the cane breaks, the narrator could be any and all Americans. He speaks in a standard English and yearns for the place of his childhood. Ready? Why are Stephen Foster's plantation melodies from the era of American minstrelsy important? By noting the radical character changes Foster injects into his minstrel song, we see this was his way of working within the system to influence those who believed what was taught to them. Yet because people fear being branded as insensitive or as racist, our modern day culture shies away from identifying with any extremes, especially if it is viewed as being politically incorrect. Therefore, many music ensembles have refused to sing many of his compositions during this decade. But today, as our public institutions seek newer and better ways to address historical truths, it is up to the modern day scholar to research and present information objectively, to find good where there is good to be found and celebrate it. By 1850, Foster had begun a trend with his plantation melodies 
which continued until his death in 1864. With the advent of the plantation song style, Foster subtly and surely ushers in a new era. By combining aspects of both the Ethiopian and the ballad song form, the previously grotesque and clownish aspects of so-called Negro melodies are softened and ridicule merges into sympathy. With the change in purpose and subject matter, the performer is no longer able to act out caricatures because they have not only been removed, but have been replaced. According to his brother Morrison, the plantation songs opened a way to the hearts of people. By changing the stereotypic narrative and recharacterizing the African on the minstrel stage, it led to actual interest in the African and his plight in America. Now, we do not know to what extent these songs influenced people's perceptions. There is no real way to know. The message in Foster's songs could not directly affect American policymaking. However, he said what he said. The best way he knew how, as composer and the father of American music. We will end um, with old folks at, no, we will end with Beautiful Dreamer. Um, could you go back to? Um, <laughs>